Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, as Amanda said, my name is Jean Persley, um, and we're going to be talking about winter sowing this evening. Um, I'm a Macomb County Master Gardener since 2004, so it's, it's a thrill to be able to join the Oakland County Master Gardeners. Um, so let's go ahead and just start, uh, jump in and, and get going. Um, I love winter sowing because you can garden in winter, and that's kind of fun and, uh, and unique to be able to do that. So tonight we're going to go through all of the details, the what, why, when, how, where, um, and this was going to be, you know, a hands-on make and take type of a program. Um, and if you're looking for that, join us next week because we're um, still scheduled to do that with the Macomb County. Um, but it's a lot of fun to be able to take something with you. So what is winter sowing? Um, the USD actually came down with the definition with the woman who has um, says she's created this process and um, advocates for it. And basically it's seeds that are sown in protective vented containers. You put them outside where they get that um, the naturally timed high germination percentage um, of climate tolerant seedlings. And we're going to go into what that means in a little bit. Um, her website is called wintersown.org, and she has a Facebook group called Winter Sowers. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that later on. So what are you going to winter sow? You can get some cues from the plants themselves and from the plant um, descriptions or even the seed package if you're purchasing plants. Does it say it requires cold moist stratification? Pre-chill the seeds or put them in the fridge or the, re or the freezer? Um, does it say they need to be stratified? Do they say that they self-sow or sow the seeds in fall outside? Um, but it is not for tropical plants. Those will not survive our weather. Another indicator is that it comes from a natural area. Is there something in the name of the plant, the common name, that indicates it might be from the natural area? For instance, oops, I forgot to click, sorry. Um, so for instance, over here, we have purple prairie clover, and that's one of our natural areas. So that's gonna tell us that this is a good candidate for winter sowing. Another clue is, does the name have something that indicates a region that is cold? So are you sowing Russian sage, um, Canada goldenrod, Canada columbine, things like that, that are gonna give you some indications of it. The supplies that you're going to need, you're going to need some sort of container that will hold about three to four inches of potting mix. Um, you can add drainage holes to that, have some condensation, and allows some height for some top growth once those seeds germinate. Then you're going to need something to seal it, some sort of tape, like duct tape, packaging, or painter's tape. And the wider tape that's like two and a half to three inches is really, really nice. It makes it easy to work with. Um, some scissors, a sharp implement. You're going to need something to puncture the bottom of your holes with um, to be able to make some drainage holes in that. Drills work really nice, as do knives. Um, I started winter sewing this week finally, and I came across a five-in-one painter's tool, and it has a little pointed end, and I said, that works for me. It was the first thing I found, and I brought that in, and I started using that. Um, moist potting mix. Uh, you want to make sure it does not have the water retaining additives in it because that'll make it too wet for you. You also um, don't need seed starting mix. It doesn't have the um, the nutrients that it's going to need eventually. It also is more expensive. So if you're looking at you know some cost savings here, that's going to be prohibitive as well. And it dries out really fast. So it's really just not the best thing that you can use. Um, you Again, with soils, you don't want to go out and get garden soil. That, as we know, in containers tends to be too heavy. Um, some people use it and they are successful. So if that's what you've got on hand, rather than going to buying some potting mix, you could sure try it. Um, and having fertilizer in that seed starting in the potting mix is going to be okay as well. You're going to need seeds, um, whether you harvest them in your yard, get them from friends, or purchase them. Something to mark your containers. Um, I really like paint pens. Um, some people use nail polish or grease pencils. Again, what do you have on hand? What do you not have to go buy? Sharpies don't use the regular Sharpies. They don't tolerate the UV lights, and they can fade. Um, and you may not have a plant labeled come spring. So you wind up with a bunch of seedlings that you're not really sure what they are quite yet. Some other things that you might want to have on hand, depending on your containers, um, 
it might be some sort of plastic to cover the containers, depending on what you're using. So if you've used some clear plastic and used it as a drop cloth for painting, you can reuse that. Um, if you have an old shower curtain, maybe that got ripped or torn or you're getting ready to throw away, you can cut that up and use it. Or even some food wrap that you want to reuse again, you can use that outside. Um, to label, some people like to put a label inside the, can the container in addition to outside. It's really just personal preference. And some folks like to use the inside cardboard tubes to toilet paper and paper towels and put those into a container um, for individual planting that way. That's again, personal preference. It may become really mushy and even get moldy, or it may draw that moisture out, kind of the same way those peat pots um, use when you use those, that wicks the moisture out of the soil. So those are some just some things to think of when you're going through this. So let's talk a little bit more about containers. To decide what containers to use, you're really only limited by your own imagination and what goes into your recycling and your uh, trash bins. You know, So before you throw something away, look at it and analyze it. I really, really, really like the milk jugs and then juice bottles. Those are two of my favorites. Um, they just, because I have them and I have easy access to them, they work really well, as do salad greens. Um, the salad greens, um, you know, they come in about three or four inch container. You can take two of those and use one as the top, oh, can you, there we go, one as the top and one as the bottom. And now you have a taller container as well as a nice size container that you're gonna be able to sew in. If you get your um, juice or milk in the cardboard containers, you can lay those the long way, cut out the top and cover that in some plastic wrap. Um, ice cream tubs, deli and dairy containers, um, your bakery containers, you might get a cake in, something like that, or even a um, the rotisserie chickens. People use those, those work out really well. Um, you can reuse plastic baggies. Um, you know, just today I was looking and I was in my pantry and I looked at and I saw this bag of tortillas that we use all year long. And I'm like, gosh, I've been throwing those away. I could even use those to do this in. So really it's just thinking about what you have. The same thing I used up um, the last of a cereal box the other day. And I'm looking in that, that waxy kind of paper, the plastic that's in there. I can use that. I can put some flour Jeez, containers Lord. into that. Yeah. I, I can use that. I can put some potting mix into something else and set that inside, and now that's created that protective environment for me. Um, some people may have an old cleared storage tub, and they will use cups inside of that. Maybe you have a party. Rather than throwing away those plastic cups, you can wash them and reuse them or reuse some of your flower pots from plants that you've purchased before. Do you have a kiddie pool? that maybe has a crack in it and no longer holds pools. Well, that's now your drainage, right? It's a broken pool, but it works perfect. Um, you could even take a bag of potty mix and lay it flat, cut an X in it and peel that back, sow your seeds and then put some of that clear plastic over the top. Maybe you, somebody delivered a dinner or a dessert in a foil pan with a clear dome, wash that out and reuse that. And you've now got your growth space as well as your soil space or your potting mix space. So it's really just what do you have on hand that you don't have to go out and buy again. Some other things that you might want to use, depending on if you're having issues with grubs, um, is coffee filters or newspapers in the bottom. It's something that will allow that water to still drain out, but will prevent maybe some slugs from getting in. I don't do that because I don't have problems with slugs, but it's something, it's one of those things that's trial and error and experience you'll be able to know whether or not you need. So why do we want a winter sow? Well, I love it because I can do it in January and February, right? I'm not out there trying to pull weeds. Um, you know, I don't have anything else going on in my garden other than trying to remove maybe some invasive species or things like that. So I can play with plants right now. Um, there's nothing better than getting that potting mix all over your hands and digging down into the soil, into the soil, into that uh, potting mix and having that on you and then being able to play with your seeds and spreading them out and getting everything just right. The other thing is the expense. It's very cost effective. You don't need lights and trays and shelves and heating mats or anything like that. You could just use your recycling and your trash. 
Um, it's a great way to repurpose, reduce, reuse, and recycle. The other thing that's really, really nice too is, um, you know, we know we can go out and we can throw seeds out in the fall or sometime in the winter. Um, but the challenge with that, there's a couple of challenges is we have birds and mice and other, you know, things, maybe voles that will eat those seeds. Um, so you're not going to have all of those seeds there to germinate. The other thing that happens is let's say you cleared a 12 inch square and you put down some some um, seedings, some seeds to, to grow. And this is where you want plant A to grow next year. So you plant your seeds in the fall. Well, what happens when all those weed seeds germinate and now you've got this nice dense layer of stuff and you don't know what is what? That's eliminated in this process as well. The other thing that's really nice is with you know, when you start something inside, before you can take it out, you have to take it in, take it out, take it in, increasing your day length outside, and that's called hardening off. And we don't have to do that with this because they're already hardened off because they're already growing outside. Um, the other thing you have to be considered concerned about is when they're outside and you get those spring rains, is that going to wash away your seedlings or the seeds and they don't even germinate? Um, they may rot. You may not get enough moisture and they're going to dry out. What's really, really nice with this is there's some basic guidelines to follow, but it's so flexible. You can vary this to meet your needs with what you have. And then, of course, the reason any of us grow any seeds is the diversity, right? You just can't always find the, the species and the cultivars that you want in the local garden center. So this increases that diversity for you. Um, and again, we have those hardy seedlings. The seeds are going to be receiving that cold, moist stratification naturally, just the way they do in nature, right? Seeds are dispersed through the fall and all winter long, and they're going through that cold, moist stratification. They're getting the freeze and the thaw, and they're getting rained on and snowed on, and all of that helps to break down that coating on the seed and make it ready so that when it warms up in the spring, it germinates and grows. I also love this because it's so easy. It's so fun. I love that it's loosey-goosey and laid back and casual, and that's my personality. Um, I know there's some of you on here that know me, and that's that. this is me. This was like made for me is how I feel. It's just so fun. Um, over here on this picture, you can just barely see that this is one of the seeds that's starting to germinate, and that was on April 24th of that year. So that was my first seed that year that I spotted that germinated. So that gives you an idea of when some of these seeds are going to start germinating. But if we have a warmer spring, it might be April 5th. Now, um, I know you're right next door in Oakland County. I'm up at the northern end. Um, so I'm kind of parallel to, um, is that Rochester Road, that 32 mile is? Uh, that's, I'm just north of that. So I'm at the far end of the county line. Um, to give you an idea. So if you're further down, I've noticed a big difference with people who are in Southern Macomb County compared to me in Northern Macomb County. So if you're in Southern Oakland compared to Northern Oakland, I'm sure it's going to be very similar for you as well. So when are you going to winter? So typically, excuse me one second. Typically they recommend at the winter solstice, which is December 21st. This year, if you recall, that week right before Christmas, we had temps that were in the 40s and 50s even. You know, so you really don't want to have your seeds out then. You don't want to risk them germinating prematurely and then be killed off by the winter. But it's nice after the solstice also is the temps are cooler um, typically, but the days also starting to lengthen. And that starts giving those seeds cues of germination, that they start waking up and they start paying attention to what's going on. And the ones that you're going to start with, the seeds to start with, so right now I've already started doing my trees and shrubs. I have one tree and one shrub that I'm doing. But any trees and shrubs that you're going to want to germinate typically have a longer cold moist stratification period that's required for them. So you're going to start looking at those and start those first. And then move into your perennials and biennials that may need that longer cold moist stratification. Um, you, you can search online on the seeds um, and find resources. You know, the world is at our fingertips right now with the internet and it's amazing. Um, some perennials may need only 30 days. Some may need 120 days. So you're going to want to start with those 120 days seeds first and then go down to your 90 and your 60 and your 30. And you can get those all done today, though, even if they have 120 or 30 days. They can all be done right now. And then you're going to go into your cold season vegetables. After that, come late winter to early spring, you're looking at things that are your tender annuals, your tender perennials, warm season vegetables, um, and doing things that way. 
from mid to late spring, you're looking at your warmer season vegetables. And some of the seed packages or seed information that you have access to, it might tell you how many days of cold temperatures it needs, that might be a clue, or it might say how many weeks before the last frost. Now that's not when you're gonna cold, when you're gonna put them outside, that just gives you an idea. If it's saying wait to after the, you know, all chance of frost has passed, that's something you're gonna wanna wait on. That's not something you wanna do right now. So it's just those clues that are in there um, because the seed packages are not designed with information for winter sowing. The other thing that's really great too is that the Facebook group that I had mentioned to you earlier, um, you can ask those questions there, that you can go into there, they have files, you can pull up their files, they have all sorts of lists, and people in there are so super helpful, it's really, really nice. Now, winter sowing is literally this easy, okay? You have your supplies ready, you cut the container and you've got your drainage holes. You put in some potty mix and plant the seeds, you seal the container and you stick it outside. That is exactly how easy it is. But Amanda and I were talking about this before we started. Humans, we love to overthink things. We love to make things harder than they are. And then we get knee deep into something and we're like, ooh, but what about this? What about that? What if I did this? What if I did that? Does it make a difference if I do this? So that's why things like this webinar, even though we have something that's so super easy, we're going to go ahead and we're going to break it down and we're going to walk through this step by step and make sure that everybody's comfortable and any questions you have, I want to be able to make sure that I can answer them for you. So let's talk about the how and where. So I like to rinse or wash my containers as I collect them. For something like a milk jug or a juice bottle, it's just a matter of putting a little bit of water in there, swishing it around and dumping it upside down, letting it drain. And then you can tie a rope around one handle and thread them all onto that, tie them up out in the garage or in your basement, wherever you have room. Um, I like to keep them thrown into a um, bag, like a trash bag or a recycling bag, you know, 13 gallon ones, I like to be able to keep them all in there because then I can grab one bag at a time, bring them into my house, and I can prepare everything as I'm getting ready to plant. Um, now, this is going to depend on your mind. Do you want to have that container fully prepped, ready to go? Do you want to make the drain holes and cut it and have it all set and ready for you for January? Or do you want to just wash them out and have them set aside and you prep them all at once? It really is up to you. It's, we all have different brains that work differently and you just make this work for you. And then gather your seeds. Does that mean during the garden season, you're saving seeds from your own yard because you really loved how beautiful this zinnia looked or this marigold or this columbine? Um, or do you want to swap seeds with somebody or are you ordering seeds online? Um, however you get your seeds, just get your seeds and it'll be fine. I like to pre-moisten my potting mix. Some people will fill the container and then um, take them outside and wet them outside. And then you have to let them drain for half a day or a full day before you add seeds and seal them up. Um, I mix it into, I have an old dish pan that I use, plastic tub dish pan. And I just mix the, that in there with some hot or warm water and it um, rehydrates it really, really nicely. I fill my container, I scatter some seeds, and then I close my jug up and um, tape it and label it and put it outside. Now, outside, where do you want to put that outside? Um, ideally, you're going to want it near a water source because at some point in time, you're going to need to be adding moisture to this. My water source is also a high traffic area next to my garage. Um, you know, we have packages dropped off there, the hose reels there. It's, you know, I've got to shovel it during the winter. So it's not someplace that I like to keep my containers over the winter. So I leave mine out in the back, but there's nobody near there. The dog doesn't go out in the back. Um, you know, nobody, no people go out there except for me to fill the, fill the bird feeders. So I know that that's a safe space. Um, but if you have a backyard that you have dogs that do zoomies in the backyard, you probably don't want that in the backyard. You maybe want it on the side or the front. Um, and then as things start warming up and the snow is gone, you can move it to that safe spot near some place where you can have access to the water. Um, having it somewhere where it's part sun, part shade, so it doesn't get, you know, it's that Goldilocks effect, right? Not too hot, not too cold. Um, is going to be a great place for it. For the most part, for the next couple of months, you really don't need to worry about these. As long as we're having snow and rain, these things are going to be staying hydrated really well, more than likely. Um, the snow gets in there and melts, um, and then it has condensation, so that condensation at the top will drip down in and kind of rewater them again, um, and that really helps. 
all you have to do is go out and you can look at them. If they're a lighter brown, you know it's dry, or you can pick them up. And if it's not as heavy as it was when you set it out there, um, then you can go ahead and water it. And, and just keep in mind that you need to check on those as it starts getting warmer. So let's talk a little bit more about the house. So the labeling. I like to use paint markers, um, and I just mark it on the outside on the top. Um, some people like to use permanent marker because they don't want to have to go buy a paint pen. So you can take duct tape across the bottom. So you're going to label it before you put potting mix and seeds in there, put a piece of duct tape on it and write down what you're sewing inside. Others might want to take a plant tag and stick that inside. And that could be an actual plant tag that maybe you have on hand. Um, it might be a piece of an old um, vinyl blind that you've mini blind that you've cut pieces of and write on, whatever you use, and you can stick that inside. Um, venting the containers is going to be important. You don't want it completely sealed um, 100%. So if you're using jugs or bottles, that just means the cap comes off and that's it. If you're using a bag, if you're reusing Ziploc bags, you seal it and then leave one end opens with something like a clothespin that hold, make sure it doesn't completely seal so that moisture can still get in. If you're using short containers that have no tops, you can put them inside bags um, and use that with something um, to hold it up. So some of your containers, say you're using, um, I've used OxyClean containers. I cut out the middle of that. You can then take that waste in the middle that you're not gonna need and use that as a support in another package or another container and be reworking some things that way. Um, another way is plastic wrap if it's not a clear lid. And that's with that OxyClean. I cut out that donut, if you will. And then I put a layer of plastic wrap on it and you pop some holes and then put the donut back on and that keeps the wrap in place. Okay, so watering. We talked about that self-watering with the condensation. Another thing you can do if it starts to dry um, is spritz it or spray it, you know, with a watering can or a little water spritzer through the top of the hole. It's easy to do that, but it takes some time to rehydrate that if it's if it's gotten dry at all. Um, so what I really like to do is I use a tray and I set a few jugs on there, pour some water into it, and it can draw it up through the bottom of the holes in those jugs, and that works really well. And that might be um, an old cookie sheet you're not using anymore, something you picked up at the yard sale or you asked for on a buy nothing page, um, things along those lines, boot trays, whatever you have that, you've, you, that you can reuse. Can, you know, it can be anything really to put a little bit of water in and be able to have that to absorb up through the bottom. Now, adding the drainage holes. This is what I did the first year I, I did this. And I did not like it. I was not a fan of it. And I've not done it since. But I do like to share people, um, share with everybody things that I've done that I don't like, because how else do we know? You may do this and absolutely love it. Um, instead, I use, um, like I told you today, um, I'm using the five-in-one painter's tool. It works really well to make the holes in the bottom. You can use a drill, just drill in a few holes. Um, you can use an X-Acto knife or a utility knife, something that can get in there. You just wiggle it around a little bit and it makes some holes for you. And then you're gonna take something um, and cut a hole, cut a slice in it. And, but it's gonna go like this. And I like to just use a pair of scissors. Once I get it going, the scissors are easy to maneuver around and that's what works for me. Some people use bandsaws. They just turn the bandsaw on and start zipping these things through there and then they're all done in no time at all. You don't wanna go all the way through though. You wanna leave this little piece together. That way there it's all in one piece and you can just move that lid back on it and seal it. You're not trying to match it up and try to find the exact perfect match. So when you're putting the seeds in, you can decide how many you want to do. You might want to do like a pan of brownies, right? And cut this up like a pan of brownies and have nine individual seedlings um, and spread them out. And it may be different depending on what the seed looks like. These seeds are a little bit bigger than these seeds. And these seeds are even bigger. And this container is a half gallon jug. So I only used five of them. So you can certainly do it that way. And when I first started, that's how I did it because I thought I don't want the work of having to separate these later on. Um, and I didn't even get them sealed up before I changed my mind. And I went ahead and I added more seeds to everything. Um, so to give you an idea, this is blue flag iris. And these are larger seeds. Um, these are pretty good sized seeds. These seeds, I actually have about two dozen of them in here. Um, and the reason I did that is blue flag iris is pretty slow growing. They don't put on a lot of top growth that first year. So I'm going to be able to sort those out really easy. And I'll use my soil knife to cut around those. Um, I find that the cutting them with a soil knife 
has um, less impact on the roots and less destruction to them than tearing them apart does. Um, so it's up to you. Now the seed box, you can see this is just sprinkled in here. These are much finer than even um, sesame seeds. You know, you probably get four of these for every sesame seed. Um, these are super, super fine. I just sprinkled that all over it because it's like powder. Um, and that worked out really well. And then those we I will take I will take later on and cut those apart. And then when you get to something like prairie smoke, sometimes you get a lot of this um, chaff, right? That excess plant material around the seeds. And I don't worry about it. That's what's nice. They don't have to be perfectly perfect. Um, as loosey goosey, remember, it's about having fun. So here we have some, some of those seeds we put in here. I added some more, I labeled it and I sealed them and then I stuck them outside and that's it and you're done. Uh, you just set it out in your yard, um, any place where it's gonna be able to drain. Um, you know, concrete may not be the best because if the water builds up and the snow builds up on the concrete, how is that gonna drain off, right? So having a, per, a, a permeable surface is gonna be helpful as opposed to something that's impervious. Now, what some people like to do is to number these. So instead of writing swamp milkweed and world milkweed, they maybe would have numbered it one and two, and then had a tracking system on maybe on a paper or a spreadsheet that said number one is world milkweed, number two is swamp milkweed. Then you can rinse these out and wash them out when at the end of the season, reuse them for next year, and number one could be seed box and number two could be irises. So it's going to depend on how you want to use these again, or do you want to just recycle them at the end of the season? It's completely up to you how you want to do that. Now here's some examples. So this right up here is just a couple of small um, three or four inch pots tucked inside of a bag that grapes came in. So if you've ever purchased grapes in a bag like this, you know it already has the holes in there. So I didn't have to make holes. The holes are on the other side, so I didn't have to add drainage holes. It was very simple to be able to get two of these inside and zip the bag back up. It was perfect. It worked out great. This here is a salad greens. I wanted to try it with just one layer. Things did germinate. Um, they didn't do nearly as well. And so in the future, when I use these, I will definitely use two, one upside down on top of the other. And then um, some juice and some milk jugs. Um, this is my first year having milk crates to put the jugs in. And boy, is that a game changer. I stacked these on top of each other and I was able to carry eight jugs outside at one time. Whereas normally you're only gonna carry, you know, two out in your hands or something along those lines. So it just made my time much more um, productive. So here's one of those OxyClean containers I tried. You can see how I cut out the middle and that allows a window and allows the light to get in. I did the same thing with my cottage cheese containers. Um, so those circles that were cut out, I could use those inside one of these bags to prop that up and provide support when those start germinating if I wanted to. So it's just a way of reusing, you know, rather than throwing these into the recycling bin, you can repurpose it in another way. Um, I've got some carry out containers here. Um, this was, I think, some cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes. Um, so just, you know, whatever you have. This was from the deli, you know, one of those two pound deli boxes. Um, just using whatever you've already bringing into your house so that you don't have to go out and buy anything else. So this is something else that I do, but it's not technically considered winter sowing because it's not in those protective environments, right? So this here is just putting out some plug trays with some potting mix and some seeds. I filled up underneath this old screen door that we had laying around and I just left it. Now this does protect it from foraging from birds and mice a little bit, um, but it's not as in that enclosed protective container that winter sowing does. And then the snow lands on it and it melts down inside of it. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit as well. So here's some of my jugs one year. This is in a recessed area that I have in my yard. Um, I tucked them down here. Um, I've thought, you know, this might protect it from some of the wind and it did. It helped them to keep them from drying out. And the snow just kind of builds up all around it. So here's a plant that's growing right here. This gives you another frame of reference. So we had some more snow and you can see they're getting buried a little bit more and more. And then a week later, we now have this where you cannot see the milk jugs at all. They're just tucked away up underneath there and they're just hanging out. They're having a good time. They're, they're tucked away until it's time for them to germinate. So a few things about um, some of the containers. So what I did is you know, you're using, if you're using the same containers, the milk jugs 
their, their, cha- their size isn't going to change. So I went ahead and measured it. And I made two marks on a piece of scotch tape on my table. And what that allowed me to do was when I went to go tape the containers to seal them, rather than trying to fight my way around with an entire roll of tape, I was able to measure it out, cut it, and all I had to deal with was that piece of tape. And I could start on one side and slowly work my way around to the other side so that I was able to secure that really well. Now, not everybody likes to use the tape. What you could do is um, you can just take the, you you have the bottom, take that lid and just hinge it down and nestle that right inside of each other. Um, Some people like to take the hole punch and make the hole punch on the top and bottom and use a, um, a bread twisty or a little piece of pipe cleaner and just twist those up that way. Um, Other people will make a slit in the top and a slit in the bottom and kind of nestle them together this way. Um, The drawbacks to any of those is that foraging mice and voles can still crawl up inside there and get to your seeds. Um, They could potentially blow open, Um, not maybe so much the twisty or the pipe cleaner, but the other ones could easily blow open if you had a, a strong gust of wind. And then you may have some condensation loss because the wind is still going to be able to get through those sides. So that can help dry out your soil faster. So it's certainly something, you know, you may want to try all of them and see what works best for you. And that's what I really like about this is that we're able to tailor it to how our own brains work. Um, And then once again, watering, 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 I don't know why that was so hard, watering from the bottom as needed is really helpful. Some people like to, um, you know, once we hit April, May, and things start germinating, they like to open them during the day and then close them at night. And that's why a lot of people don't like to tape them. Um, I leave them closed until I'm ready to plant them um, or till it's nice enough that I can leave it open all the time. I don't typically open and close. And if for some reason I've had them opened for a week or two and then we get a cold snap come through, I just go around and close them and they're typically fine for the night. I've not had problems losing plants um, because of a late cold snap while they're still in the jugs. One thing that you see oftentimes in a lot of um, conversations and programs that are done is that this is a mini greenhouse. But according to the woman who actually created this process, she says it's not a mini greenhouse, but it is a protective container. Um, So just keep that in mind because there's a ton of resources being put together out there that all call this a mini greenhouse. Okay, so it's spring, plants are germinating, and now we have all these seedlings growing. So what do we do? So this is the seeds that you saw earlier, the milkweed seeds. All of these seedlings germinated, and you can see some of them are smaller than the others. One of the things that you can do is called hunks of seedlings, where you just pull off, you know, one to two inch hunks and plant those around wherever you want them. Typically, you want to have them about two inches or two sets of true leaves, right? And we know what the true leaves are. These are your true leaves. The little ones when they first germinate, those are the cotyledons or seed leaves. So you want to make sure they have the two sets of true leaves or at least two inches. Um, Another thing you can do is pot them up individually. So maybe you have some two to four inch containers and you want to put a little bit of potting mix in there and put your seedlings into that. Um, I did that this past year with a ton of plants. My garden wasn't going to be ready for a couple of months and that was my way of holding them over without having them struggling in these containers for two more months. Um, Some people, I have one friend who um, loves to be able to offer native plants at her bird store. So she has her seeds out now and she will at some point in time once they've gone through their cold moist stratification period she will pull those jugs inside she cuts the top off and takes that entire bottom and puts them underneath grow lights. And then as they start to germinate in there she can um, pluck each one of those out and put it into a container and let it grow in a small container under grow lights and she will have larger plants to give out in her bird store um, in May. So it just depends on what you're looking to do. I'm not in a rush to get my seeds any larger, so I let everything happen outside. Okay, so let's take a look at how this works. So this here is that jug with all of the roots. These are the roots. There's just a mass of them. These roots get so big in here. And I've planted up one here and one here, and I started pulling them apart individually because I I just felt like to myself, like that just can't be right. I can't be able to pull these things apart, ripping their roots and plant them and have them do okay. So I wanted to try and that's what we do, right? We're master gardeners, we love that science aspect. And so I said, let's see what happens. It's just seeds, I'll have some more from my plants again this fall. And so I spread them all out and then I planted them all up 
And then I mulched them with some wood chips and said, okay, let's grow. And they did really great until the monarchs came. And if you've ever watched monarchs, they love milkweed seedlings because it's that juicy, tender seedlings, um, the, the plant material. It's not as hard as some of the more mature plant materials. And they were laying eggs like crazy all over this. I kept having to move them onto other plants. Um, so they really did a number on these seedlings, but I did have some of them survive. So the seedlings will work like this, but if it's gonna be a milkweed, know that you may wanna protect it from the monarchs when they start hitting the area, um, just because that really takes a toll on the seedlings. Okay, so let's take a look at some other species. This was really surprising when I put my program together um, and was adding these images to it. I was super surprised when I put them all on one page because New England aster really gets going later in the season. I was really surprised that it was so much larger compared to the culver's root, but the culver's root doesn't get as big as fast in one year. And the same thing with the turtle head. Those are both slower growers individually when you look at it that way. Um, and you can see the difference here. You know, so the turtle head has some really nice leaves going up this way, or I'm sorry, the culver's root, but they also have a whole lot of that are just now germinating um, here at the end of May and you're just seeing cotyledons. And then my turtle head was kind of pretty sporadic cup plant, purple prairie clover, um, and then nodding wild onion. Both of these are pretty slow growers. The cup plant has big leaves, but it grows slow that first year. Um, mine didn't get much bigger than this. Um, also, once I planted it, the bunny ate it. So it had to recover a little bit. So here we have some more, again, tons and tons of cotyledons all on the same day with that large growth of the New England aster. Even the brown-eyed Susan, you have a few that have some nice big true leaves, but a lot of really fresh cotyledons as well. Let's take a look at the showy goldenrod. It looks like it's pretty good. Um, this was grown in a juice container. This is the root ball. So this has roots all the way down that three to four inches or so of that juice container. And then this is the bottom. Had this been a larger pot, those roots would have kept going in a larger pot, but they, you know, they got root bound there at the bottom. Here's those plug trays I showed you underneath the screen. So these all germinated and they're all doing quite well later on and they're doing great. So they can stay in there, you know, and leave them in there for a couple of months because they've got a nice um, root ball area to be able to grow. So it's just another option, but remember it's not winter sowing. So my seedlings, I potted up into um, three, four inch containers. I also use some of my super packs because those have a decent sized root ball. So I use those for some of the smaller plants. So this is what they look like in June. Um, here's that cup plant getting planted out. It looks so small in the, when you put it into the mulch, it just kind of gets buried and lost. Um, but here's the seedlings that I potted up. So these are some two inch seedlings, um, two inch pots and some four inch pots. And I just left them out um, so that they could grow out until my garden space was ready. Now the milkweeds and some of the other things that the rabbits really like, I went ahead and put them on a pallet that I recycled off our buy nothing group and some free kitty litter buckets that I was able to source and I just elevated it up the height of a kitty litter bucket and that was enough to keep it out of the way of easy reach for rabbits so I was able to have this little nursery so as I was ready to plant plants I just went over and went oh what do I want to plant today or I have this space in my garden what do I want to put in it and I was able to have my free plants that I had grown out that way so this is the garden that I was waiting to put in I added this space right here um, this addition had been put in a couple years before, so those seedlings are still growing in. I put in um, the rain garden, you know, a few years ago, and so now I'm trying to tie it all together with the other flower bed that I had added in. I'm trying to reduce some of my, my lawn space that I don't have to mow it as much. So what had happened was on July 25th, my son-in-law found this boulder online um, for free. Somebody was giving it away, so he went and got it for me and just delivered it. And so I was ready to plant. I was just waiting on that and it was perfect timing. When I had my wood chips dropped off to start this garden, um, my tree guy brought me some logs. I'd been asking him for some logs. So he brought me those and I was able to create some pathways in here as well. So I can still access with my mower and my wagon and be able to move um, mulch and plant material around in the future. And then I was able to source these um, bricks on our buy nothing group in our community. And I'm gonna create that as the edging for this garden. So I'll be able to, to finish that um, hopefully this year or next year. So we'll see, um, but I'll show you what I did this past summer with it. So, oh, and look, I even have a bunny ready to, to come and eat all the seedlings that I plant. And he did. 
So the next day I took some of my seedlings that I had grown and some seedlings that I had purchased from plant sales and laid them all out, right? And we know we put the pots out before we plant them because then we can walk around the space. Um, I took several pictures of it and sat down in the shade and looked at them. Is everything where I want it to be? Do I want to move anything? How is it before I plant it? Um, so that I'm only planting it once. Now I do want to point out if you can just barely make out these plants right here, there's a little bit of red foliage. And that red foliage is because it had gone through some cold weather while it was in the container. So it, the, the cold had changed the foliage color a little bit. But keep in mind, this is a two inch pot, okay? So keep those in mind. Um, and then, oh, let me go back. This, this here are some great blue lobelias. There's six of them, three here and three over here. So now this is what they look like, all of those same plants planted. You can barely make out these plants with this red foliage. And this is, it's a nearly native, it's called Royal Catchfly. And then here are those um, great blue lobelias there and you can't even see the ones I planted back here. But look at them a month later. So we've gone from the end of July to the end of August. These are those red, um, the Royal Catchfly with that red foliage. They were in the two inch pots a month ago and this is how big they were. So imagine if instead of having them in those two inch pots for two months, they could have gone in the ground. They would have been huge. And then here's the great blue lobelia here and then some in the back. And then a couple weeks later, my great blue lobelias are blooming and except for this one. So this is what's still interesting is each seed is still different, right? So these grew into really nice big plants and bloomed. And this one is like, are you even going to make it to next year? Um, so that's what it looked like by mid-September. These are those royal catch flies. They were over a foot tall. Um, and if they'd have had a few more weeks, they would have bloomed for this year. So um, had I put them in the ground instead of into the two inch pots for two months, I may very well have had blooms on those this year. And then here's some Coreopsis that I had in another part of the garden. But that's how big these seedlings got. Um, it's just absolutely amazing what, what these plants can do. So failure is an option, right? Like sometimes the best plans just don't work out. So some people go, ah, I tried it one year, it didn't work. I'm not gonna do it again. Okay, well, what went wrong? Let's take a look at that, let's break it down, right? If something went wrong, if it didn't work, something went wrong, let's try and do it differently next year. So it might be that the light, you have too much or too little, right? Did you fry all your seeds or um, did they not germinate because you had them on the north side of your house and they never saw, um, you know, under a maple tree and they never saw any sun? How about that water? Do you have too much or too little? Did they drown and rot or did they dry up because they germinated and then there was nothing there to stain the roots? What if you put them on the side of the house and you forgot about them until you went over there at the end of June and you had these half dead seedlings um, that you completely forgot about? Well, most of us, you know, carry phones around. You can set reminders on your calendars. Um, check them March 15th. Check them March 31st, um, April 15th, April 31st. Set those reminders. And then once things start to germinate, you're going to want to go check those, you know, every day or two, making sure that they're, um, they're hydrated and that they're not drying out on you or then they're not drowning either. Um, you know, are they spindly and they flop? Are they short and they stumpy? Did you have slugs eating them or rabbits eating them? You know, what can you do to offset and mitigate those problems that you've had? And if you can't figure it out, um, you know, post a picture somewhere online and social media and ask for advice. Who doesn't love to give their opinions to things that, <laughs> when somebody needs help? And maybe when everybody's helping each other, we can all figure out what went wrong with that one problem. And sometimes it might be, oh yeah, those were like 15 year old seeds. I threw them in there just to see if they germinate or not. And they may just have not been able to germinate. So it's just, you know, maybe they weren't viable seeds to begin with. Um, you know, it's just really, you know, I hate to see people give up on this after trying once with one jug and not being successful. So I have some plants I'm just gonna highlight really quickly. These were some plants that I did um, for a make and take last winter. Um, Brown-eyed Susan is one that's a really easy to germinate. Um, it'll reseed around your garden. It may be too prolific for you. I've not had that problem at all. Um, I love when it pops up wherever it wants to. And prairie or yellow coneflower is another one that does that. It's, they're short lived and they like to just pop up wherever they're, they're happy. Um, I love how dainty these petals are the bees love them um, and it just really looks electric with this um, blue monkey flower in front of it i'm um, really graceful and delicate the purpy pr purple prairie clover is a 
plant that's like my nemesis. I can't get it to grow in my yard because the rabbits keep eating it. So I'm going to grow some more this year. I got some um, chicken wire and I'm going to cage them <laughs> and hope that the rabbits can't get to them because they love them. But this is in an area about two miles from my house at a public garden space that I had planted some and I just love them. And the rabbits haven't found them in this space. They're doing really, really well. The foliage is very dainty. This is one of those plants that you would consider a see-through plant um, because you can plant it, but you're not going to get that high impact with large blooms or large foliage. Um, so it's a really nice plant that you can have and add it to your garden and, and touch it in places. Oh, I don't know if you guys are hearing this. I hope I forgot to turn the volume off on it. Um, but this is um, swamp milkweed, which is really terrific. This brings in all sorts of pollinators, right? So this here is a um, giant swallowtail nectaring on it. I get all sorts of wasps and bees and um, clear wing moths and um, other butterflies that will come and nectar at this. It's just a really, really high attractant. And the fragrance is absolutely astounding. Um, the petals drag down this way and stand out really beautifully. Um, it's a host for the monarch butterfly. So you'll find caterpillars eating that. Um, you can find eggs on your milkweed plants. Um, on the flowers, they will lay their eggs on any part of the, the plant and it's just absolutely beautiful. The next one is the wild nodding onion. You can see how it got its name with this nodding blooms on here. Um, the upright strappy foliage is just so pretty. The blooms before they open have this little bit of a mysterious look to them. And as they start to open, they're still hanging and then eventually turn upright in this fireworks type of bloom. It's very pretty. Now, the resources I mentioned earlier was wintersown.org and the Facebook Winter Sowers. And the Facebook group, it looks like this, and it's going to be a group by Winter Sown Educational. That's the nonprofit name that, that sponsors this. Um, I did find two extension based um, publications, or I'm sorry, they're not publications, they were um, like a bulletin or an, uh, a article and these are the links for them they're in the the handout that you should have received and these both neither one of them were really a completely up to what I would have liked to have handed out I think they both mentioned the mini greenhouses and they both use some terminology that wasn't quite accurate they gave me the um, impression that maybe somebody had written it off of somebody else's blog post um, type of a thing rather than having it actually be some science-based information um, so I do have a Facebook page. It's called BMO Logistics Garden. You're welcome to like that and follow along there. Um, I love sharing some fun informational things. Um, I get to be silly and goofy on there. Um, not quite as much as I do on my own page, but it's still fun to share some, some gardening information with everybody. Um, I will be more than happy to answer questions. Um, if you have any thing that you wanna go back and look at, we can do that too. And I thank you all so much for coming today. We did have a question uh, in the chat, a couple questions actually. Um, the okay. first one was regarding when you're planting your seeds. I know a lot of your pictures you showed us just had the seeds on top. Do, mm -hmm. you, do you just leave them on top or do you push those in at all or cover them up or? Yeah, so it's gonna vary based on the seed, right? Because does your seed information say that it requires light? Does it say that it requires dark? Some plants need you know, a, a quarter inch of soil over the top or an eighth of an inch of a soil. Most plants that I'm using are um, the natives and they typically are dispersed by wind. Most of the seeds that I'm using are wind dispersed. Um, so those are just kind of floating off and then they're landing on the soil. And then through that cold moist stratification, through wind hitting it, through rain hitting it, it kind of makes contact with the soil. So what I do is I just kind of tap it around a little bit and do it that way. I do not cover it with any soil at all because I try to replicate how it may have happened. You know, there are some seeds that ants carry off and go bury in a tunnel somewhere. Um, I don't have those plants though, so I don't use that method. So it's just, it's really gonna based on the, on the plants, which seed you're using and knowing what that requirements are, but I do just have, make, ensure soil contact. Okay. And then somebody was asking, do you have any experience with uh, Columbine? I do the native Columbine, absolutely. Was there a specific question or concern that was arose? Um, they just said if you've tried or if you haven't had any success with them. 
Yeah, I, I love the native columbine. Um, the hummingbirds do, the bees do, um, the goldfinches love the seeds. So if you can get to the seeds before the goldfinches eat them all, um, those I ha I did, um, I winter sowed those last year um, because I, I have so much of them and I wanted to share them because I just love them. It's such a great plant. Um, but normally in my garden, I just take the seed heads and walk around and kind of scatter them and let them grow because um, they, they reseed really, really well that way. So rather than normally tying up, you know, jugs that way, I just scatter those directly in my garden because those are such a unique, um, when they're even when they're just have one leaf on them, they're such a distinctive leaf pattern that for me, it's very easy to identify, but they do winter sow really well. And then somebody's asking too, can you use seeds from hybrid coneflowers to sow over the winter? Yeah, yep, you can. If you're if you're interested in hybrid coneflowers, absolutely. And then somebody's asking about using salad containers. And what did you mean by needing a second layer? Do you just mean turning one on top of so the other? Take two, right? So you have two salad containers and you just invert one onto the other so that you have like a lid and a base. So that gives you that three inches of soil on the on the bottom or potting mix and a three inch for the growth on the top. And then somebody was asking if you've ever tried uh, Ascalepsis tuberosa. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I just sowed some today, actually. So, yeah, that does really, really well. And as you know, it's a slow grower. So it's one that um, if you have a shorter container or smaller container, it works in really well. Asclepius tuberosa, which is butterfly weed, that that grows really well. Mm -hmm. And then um, do you ever have any problems with critters getting into them, like squirrels and the rabbits? I mean, is that ever yeah. a problem? And well, and I did. So one year, you know, I had beautiful milkweeds growing and I, they were sitting on my driveway and I just was so excited. And then I went out the next day and my six inch milkweeds were nubs because the rabbits ate them down to nothing because the rabbits will eat um, the swamp milkweeds and well, the other milkweeds too. Um, so that's why I created um, that little bench. I took that pallet, put it on kitty litter buckets and the rabbits could jump that high if they wanted to, but mine must be lazy and they're not. They must be happy with the, with the, um, dandelion leaves in the yard. Um, I leave all of those because they really like those, but um, my seedlings must have just been too good to pass up. So elevating those things that they do like, and then I'll leave the other things on the ground that they don't tend to like. And some of that is just trial and error, right? Is, oh, well, they ate that. I better move that up. <laughs> and is, they didn't eat this one, so I can leave this one down. Is it mainly a thing like they don't bother them until after they've germinated kind of thing? Yes, I've not had problems with um, rabbits or squirrels knocking them over, um, mm -hmm. you know, but if you have squirrels in your yard, you know, they can jump around and be playful. So maybe don't put it near trees where you know that they are active. Don't put them near your bird feeding poles where they're going to be active. Try to keep it out of their pathway. And somebody's asking what source you use for wildflower seeds. Um, I use those in my yard. So I have native plants growing in my yard that I've purchased from various local native plant growers like um, wild type and East Michigan natives. Um, there's a few others that I've used um, and I grow them in my yard and I'll harvest those seeds. Um, I have also purchased native um, plants or seeds from prairie nursery and prairie moon nursery, but I try to get a local genotype um, or super local genotype whenever possible. Those are my secondary choices because that's more of a um, eco region, eco type. And have you ever, is, can you do winter sowing with like bulbs at all? Or is that a thing? Well, I mean, so with the bulbs, they're, they're different because those are, oh, wasn't this fun? I learned that word from Master Gardener College last year. What, uh, last year, what they call those? Um, geophytes, right? That's such a cool word, geophytes. So it's a different mechanism. So it already has everything into it. And what you can do with bulbs, you know, we've known this part for years where you can put them into containers, into pots, and some people put them in their fridge um, to speed up the time frame. So like, say, for instance, you know, this bulb needs 12 weeks of cold, rather than having that 12 weeks go through the winter, they might put it 12 weeks and start it in September in their fridge and then take that container out and um, have us blooms earlier. So you can do that. I've not done it in this method. If I was going to pot up bulbs um, to have, I would just put them in pots. Um, mm -hmm. And you can 
leave those outside in a protected area or even in your garage. Because I've brought some of my um, larger pots into my garage and I thought perennials were dead. And the next spring I look and I'm like, what is that growing out of the container? And there's something growing and it, it hasn't even had any moisture since it was moved into my garage in October. And here it is, you know, in April and there's stuff growing in my garage. So plants are pretty amazing. Yes, they are. <laughs> They're so resilient. Did anybody else have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or um, use the chat and chime in. If there's anything that you had to, would like to ask Jean. I know you had mentioned in the beginning about starting trees and shrubs. Do you have any favorites on the tree and shrub category that you try starting from winter sowing? I'm guessing it's probably not as prolific as a <laughs> space, but. Well, I, um, I had a red bud that like 12 years ago, a friend gave to me, she had propagated it from her native red bud. Um, and she's the one, she was my, my native plant mentor um, from like 15 years ago. And she had given me this red bud stick. And I was literally a month out from moving from Southern Macomb to Northern Macomb. And I'm like, ah, what do I do with this plant? So I kind of peeled it in up here and went, I'll move it later. And like three years later, I finally moved it. And it grew into this massive, beautiful red bud tree. And, um, then I wasn't, I was watching it and pruning it properly at the beginning. And then, you know, you forget to maintain your plants. And mm -hmm. next thing I know, it had this really nice Y and it split. <laughs> and oh, I'm like, yeah. oh, oh no, oh no, I didn't prune it properly. Um, so it put, it put out seed. So I harvested every red bud seed I could find mm -hmm. on that plant that I could reach on the tree. And I put them. So remember I showed you that screen that had all of that. So I I did a plug tray, an entire plug tray, but I had filled up my deep ones first already. So I use these short ones that are like two inches. So this, mm -hmm. there was a gap between the screen and the thing. And I think the mice ate them all <laughs> because oh, no. that or the wind came and blew them, nothing germinated. And I couldn't even find seeds, like they were gone. And so that didn't work. So I am doing some red bud seeds again, because you never ever use up all of them at once, right? Until you get more. So mm -hmm. I'm doing some red buds again. So, um, cause I need to replace that tree that I'm killing. Um, and I, they're just such beautiful trees. So I'm doing that one. And then this year I'm doing, um, witch hazel, um, and they have some of the most beautiful seeds you've ever seen. They're just absolutely exquisite, shiny, blacky brown colors. Um, and so I'm super excited about that. So, yeah, so, but I have not had success propagating them in a, with a woody propagation by cutting. Um, they all just rot. I don't know what I'm doing. So maybe if you guys have a webinar on that, I'll watch that one because I need help in that area. I think I overlove them and they die. <laughs> Easy to do. Well, thank you so much for coming and speaking for us. Again, if anybody else has anything that they want to add um, before we close things up, but it was a really fascinating presentation. And I'm sure a lot of people are probably going to be digging through their seed stash and seeing what they can get started while we're waiting out the cold for the next few weeks or so yeah and that's what makes it nice right I was outside for like 10 seconds to drop off some milk jugs and what was right back in <laughs> yeah it's all it you want to be perfect. out right now <laughs> it was perfect great well, thanks thank so much for joining us everybody yeah thank you so much for talking for us as well and um yeah, yeah thanks for coming in today thank you you're all welcome Thank you, Jean. It was a great, uh, great and informative talk. Oh, thanks, Sarah Jane. I appreciate it. I'm like, that voice sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> you may have heard it a few times. Yeah, a few over the last 16 or 18 years, however long it's been. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Are you guys still having a meeting after this? Oh, nope, this is oh, it. Everybody's yeah. just still sticking around.